So we are going to look at the topic still dealing with the glory of God, but in the context of two churches. You know, there's always been two churches. When we look at the time of Christ, for example, when Christ came, it was not his intention to have two churches, but according to the account that we read about in the book of Luke, when he came, the main body, the main line, the main church, the organization rejected him. Then he went about to seek for a few others to do the work in a self-supported way. Self way. Hence you had the uh, self-supported group and then the, or the organization in the disciples and Christ's day. And we're going to look at that in the context of the ten virgins, in the context of the ten virgins. Let's have a word of prayer. Loving Father, our God, we invite your presence here again. Uh, we want to be blessed by you. We want our mind to be enlightened once again. And as we are about to look at this subject matter again this afternoon, we pray, Father, that uh, we will be blessed by what you have to teach us and to share with us. In Jesus' name, Amen. You know, the Bible tells us that the church is the pillar and the ground of truth. That's what the church is supposed to be. A place where sinners could come and find truth and understand the plan of salvation and to study the Word of God and to become even more acquainted with Jesus Christ. Of course, this is something that we also have to do personally on a daily basis in our closet, in our room, in our bedroom. We need to become more acquainted with Jesus Christ personally, individually. But at the same time, as we were told that in the multitude of uh, counseling, there was wisdom. Uh, there was wisdom in the multitude of counseling. And the, the church was organized to not only to be a pillar, a light for Jesus Christ, but also to strengthen each other and to help us grow in grace. But it has to be based on the truth as we are coming together as one, as a group, as a church, as Jesus says. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. is truth. And also, the Bible tells us that it is the truth that will set us free. Let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 25. Matthew, chapter 25. As we are looking at the uh, parable of the ten virgins, those ten virgins there represent as well two churches, two categories there we find describing their allegiance to God, to Jesus Christ, the ten virgins. They all claim that they were Christians, right? They also called their name Christian. They all had lamp, for example, as you see on the screen, they all had lamp. But what was missing they had lamp. They did not have the oil in order to have the light, right? They did not have the oil in order to have the light, which is really the light is the glory of Jesus Christ, the character of Jesus Christ. Hence, when Christ comes again with His glory, in His glory, as we read this morning, and those who reflect that glory, that light, they will inherit the kingdom. He will take them home. The Bible tells us that in verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in His glory, there, there is the word there, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. How many times do you see the word glory there? Twice. Twice. It's describing this magnificent event. It's describing an event that the world has never experienced before, that glory, that brightness. 
And keep in mind again, as I mentioned several times before, the Bible says that the wicked will be destroyed by the brightness of His coming. And what is that brightness? That's the glory. And the Bible asks the question, who can endure that sight, that glory? Who can stand in before His presence? Who can stand? Only the few. Then notice in verse 32, And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the King say unto them on His right hand, Come ye blessed of My Father, inherit the kingdom, prepare when? Prepare for you from the foundation of the world. So, as in the case of the virgins or the ten virgins, we see two categories there as well that Christ is describing, right? How many we see? Two categories. Two categories of people, the sheep and the goat. And keep in mind, you'll, you'll, you will find that within the church as well. Now, let's go backward again. To verse 1 of the same chapter. Verse 1 of the same chapter says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were what? Wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. They had the lamp, right? They had the name, keep that in mind, they had the name, but they did not have the oil. Is it possible, this is a question now, is it possible to have the name Seventh-day Adventist written somewhere, but it does not mean anything as far as God is concerned? Is it possible? That is possible. Because that's what the Bible tells us here. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Notice the condition of the church. Both churches were sleeping, right? Mm -hmm. Both churches were sleeping, but one was sleeping a different kind of sleep. One was sleeping... Well, we might say with one eye open, right? They had made preparation. They were on alert. Yeah. Right. They, alert. Yes, they slept not because they were lazy, right? They slept because, well, let's just say it was time to sleep. But at the same time, they had made preparation, as we just read. The Bible says that. I did not say it. It says... But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So they had the oil ready to go in the lamp, right? They had the oil in the lamp ready to go. It was just a matter of time for them to light it up. Amen? It was just a matter of time for them to light it up and to go out to meet the bridegroom because that's what the Bible says. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Now, when you compare this passage here with the book of Matthew, chapter 13, 7, verse 13, where Jesus described the narrow path and the broad path. Again, two choices. Two churches, two groups, two choices. One will follow the broad path, the other one, the narrow path. When you also compare this, with Revelation chapter 3, which describe the last church, the Laodicean church. And then also the church that came before that, which is the Philadelphia church. Now, again, two churches. Remember, as a movement, we studied out as what? As Philadelphia, the brotherly love. Amen? But the church, the organization has turned into... Laodicean. Mm -hmm. And what does the Bible say about Laodicean? Lukewarm. That's what it means. And God says, I will 
spew thee out of my mouth if you remain in this Laodicean condition, right? God cannot tolerate Laodicean condition. He wants you to make a decision. Either you're going to be hot or cold, right? And that applies to us individually as well, not just as in church, as an organization, but individually. We need to make up our mind what we are going to do. I believe it is the Apostle James who says that a double-minded man is what? Trouble in all his way. If you are double-minded and you look one, you don't know what to do. Have you ever been in that situation? I know I've been in that situation. It is not a good feeling. It is not a good feeling when you are being uh, pulled in two directions, two different directions. It is not a good feeling. And you feel like you can't make up your mind. I know I've been there. But when we are in that state of mind, we cannot have truly peace rest of mind we have to make a decision either we are going to follow jesus or follow our own ways but as we are dealing with the church god had a very good plan for the church especially in the end times dealing with the the seed of the woman we are told that god has raised this movement as a light as watchmen to sound the alarm, to proclaim the fourth angel's message along with the third angel's message. Our pioneers experienced the midnight cry, which is in the case of the ten virgins there. The midnight cry, the first and the second angel's message. And we were given the understanding of the third angel's message and as well of the fourth angel's message. But we have to combine all of these messages together to proclaim this with a loud cry. Let me read you a few things here about the plan, the vision that God has for His church and our work in these last days. Notice carefully on the screen what Spirit of Prophecy tells us here. From With Your Herald, July 20th, 1886. It is with an earnest longing that I look forward to the time when the events of the what? Of the day of Pentecost shall be repeated with even greater power than on that occasion. John says, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power. And what else? And the earth was lightened with his glory. Then as at the Pentecost season, the people will what? Hear the what? Hear the truth spoken to them, every man in his own tongue. Notice that same miracle that took place then will happen again in these last days. Mm -hmm. My question is, what is God waiting for to do this? Which will be even more than what happened on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago. It will be even more. Why? Because they had received the early rain and we are looking for the latter rain, which is a lot more shower than the early rain. Notice, then as at the Pentecost season, the people will hear the truth spoken to them. Every man in his own tongue, God can breathe new life into every soul that sincerely desires to serve him and can touch the lips with a live cold from off the altar and cause them to become eloquent with His praise. This is what God is looking forward to. That's what, that's what God wants to do for the church in these last days. Again, as both the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy tells us, it's the latter rain which is a whole lot more powerful than the early rain. Let's continue to read. Notice. Thousands of voices will be what? Imbued. Imbued with the power to speak forth the wonderful truths of God's word. The stammering tongue will be unloose. Notice. And the timid will be made strong to bear courageous testimony to the truth. I can relate. Can you relate? I can relate to all of that. The stammering tongue will be unloose and the timid will be made strong to bear courageous 
testimony to the truth. I used to stammer a lot when I was younger. I mean, it was bad. It was awful. And I was a very, very shy person. I shared this in my testimony before. You would pay me a zillion dollars, if there's such a thing. You would pay me a zillion dollars to stand before a crowd and to speak. No way. I'm not going to do that. I don't care how much money you've got. Uh, I, I will not do it. As a matter of fact, even when I was in school, especially in high school, when they would send me, the teacher would try <laughs> to send me to the board to stand in front of the class, yeah. to do something in front of the class. And good. all of a sudden, I will forget everything. The moment I, I get in front of this crowd of uh, lions, <laughs> I call them, I forget everything. Everything. I'm like shaking. I, I, all of a sudden, I feel like I don't even know what 2 plus 2 was. Amen? <laughs> I feel like I don't know. So I can, I can testify of that. I can understand exactly what this is saying. But when, as she says here, when the Spirit of God comes in, when you allow the Spirit of God to come in, which is, by the way, the oil, right? right? Mm -hmm. Which is the oil. When you allow the Spirit of God to come in, all of a sudden those uh, screws, you know, that could not run anymore. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, all of these things started to right. function. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden, those tongues that were what again, as she says? Stammering. Stammering. They become what? Loose. And those who are shy are not shy again. Glory be to the Almighty God. Notice, mm -hmm. may the Lord help His people to cleanse the soul temple from every defilement and to maintain such a close connection with Him, that they may do what? Be partakers of the latter rain, when it shall be poured out. So Sister White was looking forward to this shower, to the latter rain. And we are told we need to pray for this, pray for the latter rain. But unfortunately, as we are looking at the two churches, when this happened, we are also told that the majority will not recognize it. When the latter rain, as in the early rain, fell upon the disciples, did the majority recognize it? No. They mocked the disciples. They thought those men were drunk. Notice, let's keep reading. She goes on to say, The church has been appointed as what? As the medium through which divine what? Light is to shine into the where? Moral darkness of this world. And the peace given beams of the Son of Righteousness fall upon the hearts of men. The church must arise and what else? Shine. Radiant with the Spirit and power of the truth. The people of God must go forth to a world lying in darkness to make manifest. To make what? Manifest the light of the glory of God. To make manifest. What does that mean to make manifest? Make known. To make known. Amen. That's exactly right. That's exa that is character, as you said. That's his character. And to, that should be manifest or to make known or to display, right? Exactly. Notice. It goes on to say, Radiant with the spirit and power of the truth, the people of God must go forth to a world lying in darkness to make manifest the light of the glory of God. God has given to men noble powers of what? Of mind to be employed to His honor. And in the missionary work, these powers of mind are called into active exercise. Active exercise. That was the condition of the five wise. Again, two churches. You have one that had made preparation that understood the signs of the times, that was also proclaiming the final warning for this time to the a world, as we just read, that are plunging deeply in darkness, but while the other ones, as in the case of Revelation 3, the Laodicean church, 
thought that they had everything, but they didn't need anything. But really, in reality, as Christ says, they were miserable, naked. They did not understand their true nature. They did not understand their condition. You know why? Because they did not allow Jesus to come into the heart. This is the reason why Christ, in the same chapter, to the Laodicean, is portrayed as being on the outside of the house, knocking on the door, knocking on the heart, to allow him to let him in. But they had rejected him. Two churches, as in the case with the disciples and Jesus, versus the Pharisees, two churches will be found within the remnant church again in the last days. One will keep the commandments of God all the way and follow the narrow path in the faith and patience and the love of Jesus. Notice the next statement there. With you and Herald, March 24th, 1891. Wise improvement. What is it? Wise. Wise improvement and development of the gifts of God will be seen in where? In His servants. Day by day, there will be growth in the knowledge of Christ. He who once spake, as never men spake, who wore the garb of humanity, is still the great teacher. As you follow in his footsteps, seeking the lost, angels will do what? Draw near and through the illumination of the Spirit of God, greater knowledge will be obtained as to the best ways and means for accomplishing the work committed to your hands or to our hands. That's what the Bible tells us. In the book of Matthew, based on what we just read here, if we were to summarize what we just read here, we could say, based on what Matthew chapter 5, verse 48 says, Be ye therefore perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. God is calling His people to holiness, has been calling His people to holiness. Even when He brought them out of Egypt, the call was to come to holiness. And we cannot come into holiness and then partake of the sins of Babylon and the pleasures of Babylon. Because the message that we find again in Revelation 18, beginning in verse 1, the earth must be lightened with the glory of the messenger, that's what the angel there represents. And that glory is the holiness of Jesus Christ. It is His character as well. He is holy. Be ye holy, God says, for I am holy. And that's the glory, that's the brightness that the world must be enlightened by. And once we do this, then the call comes in verse 2 to Tell the world that Babylon is what? Is fallen. Is fallen. And what's the counsel? Come out of her, my people. Why? Notice. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah. You can find the answer, the why answer, in chapter 18 of the Revelation as well. Verses 2 all the way down to verse 5. But let's look at Isaiah chapter 48. Let's go to the book of Isaiah chapter 48. Notice what the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 48. Let's look at verse 20. Isaiah 48 verse 20. The Bible says, Go ye forth of Babylon. Why? Flee ye from the Chaldeans. That's repetition there. Still Babylon. Chaldeans, Babylon, same thing. With a voice of what? Singing. Declare ye. Tell this. Utter it even to the end of the earth. Say ye, the Lord have done what? Redeem his servant Jacob. So the call to come out of Babylon is a call of redemption. Is a call of salvation. Tell ye to everyone, to everyone, come to Jesus where we can find salvation. Chapter 52. Go to chapter 52 of the same book. And notice again the call. Verse 11. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence. Touch not 
unclean or no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye what? Clean. That bear the what? The vessel of the Lord. Be ye what? Clean. And to be clean there, meaning be holy. Then it goes on to say, For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your reward. God will be before you and behind you. But now, if you are not clean, you will not be able to endure the glory of God before you and behind you. Amen? You will not be able to endure the glory. So the call to be clean is a call to overcome sin. To give up sin. Because Babylon, again, represents sin. That's part of the call of coming out of Babylon. It's a call to come out of sin. It tells us that victory over sin is possible. How? In Christ Jesus. As Philippians 4.13 tells us, I can do how much? Nothing. All things through Christ Jesus who strengtheneth me. I can do all things. Through Christ Jesus, who does what again? Who strengtheneth me. So the church was supposed to be this light. As we read about again, the five wise virgins who had made preparation in at midnight. Remember midnight, the darkest hour. That's what midnight represents. At the darkest hour, they had the light. Amen. They had the light with them. So that at that darkest time of the night, people could see the light, the glory of Jesus Christ. Again, remember what Revelation chapter 18 says. Go to Revelation chapter 18 with me. And we read this before, but again, we cannot really outdo the word of God. Chapter 18, speaking about Babylon, the reasons why God is calling a people out of Babylon. Bible says, verse 2, And he cried mightily, notice the word mightily, with a strong voice. What does it say? Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become what? The habitation of, habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and what else? And a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have done what? drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are wax rich through the abundance of her delicacy that's the reason why the call comes in verse 4 so what the bible just described to us here in verses 2 and 3 it's the sins of babylon so the call to come out of babylon is to come out of sin as Revelation chapter 17 tells us, verse 5, that Babylon is responsible for all the abominations of the world. So, therefore, if God calls us to holiness, to effect His glory in these last days, there should not be anything unclean among us, anything that would draw us or make us look like we are with Babylon, right? But notice... This is from Advent Messenger, February 8th, 2020. What does it say there? A professor at Pacific Union College says, it's time to do what? Embrace to embrace same-sex same -sex marriage. Yeah. Now, wow. what is Pacific Union College? That is a Seventh-day Adventist college. So you have a professor, Seventh-day Adventist, is teaching what there? That we should embrace same-sex marriage. Why? Because according to him, the Bible is wrong or the Bible is outdated or the Bible doesn't really say that you cannot have same-sex marriage. That's what we are about to read here. Now keep in mind, as we are about to read this, Keep in mind what we just read a moment ago. What the church was supposed to be like. A pillar, the ground of truth. A light to this world that is rapidly 
plunging deeper into darkness. We were supposed to be a light. But we have embraced, we have been made drunk by the wine of Babylon. That is the general conference. Now, who wrote this about accepting or embracing same-sex marriage within the church? Where did this come from? Notice. This is from the Seventh Day or Seventh Gay Adventist Kingship International. Notice, Brian Ness, he has a PhD, which means permanent head damage, right? <laughs> Dr. Brian Ness, permanent head damage, has been teaching biology, genetics, and biotechnology classes at Pacific Union College. There it is. For the past 30 years, his wife, Judy, is a licensed clinical social worker who works as a counselor in the campus counseling center. Brian and Judy are two of the sponsors for the what? Gay Straight Alliance group on their campus and serve on the SDA Kinship Advisory Council. Let's pause. So this professor teaching at Pacific Union College, Seventh-day Adventist Pacific Union College, he is part of the board for this organization, the SDA Kinship Advisory, which does what? Promote sodomy. Now, the conference, I'm telling you, we as a people have been deceived. Remember the study we did this morning about deception coming from Satan? The same deception you find them within the organization. The organization put out a quote-unquote statement on homosexuality. Maybe it sounds like this stands for Bible principle. Now, for example, this is a smoke screen. This man is working where? At Pacific Union College. But he's also part of what? The board of SDA Kinship, which does what? Promote sodomy. Yet he's allowed to be a professor at an Adventist college, which is basically under the general conference. Yeah. It's a smoke screen. They're playing you and I. It's the same thing they have done with women ordination. You can't have women ordain or, or women ordination, whatever they call it. And the vote in 2015 says you cannot ordain a woman, but yet Ted Wilson with his own mouth, and I even read it, from the general conference policy says, you can still have women, pastor. Then what was the vote in 2015 about? Mm -hmm. They will come out and say, hey, 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 you know, uh, the general conference voted that, this and that. You can't have women, pastors, or, or ordain women. The, the thing is, you can still have women, pastor, but don't, don't call it women ordination. Mm -hmm. It has to be commission pastors but they can still function the same way now the question is where is the biblical backup for this right. to have a woman serve as a pastor where is the biblical backup for this show me a woman ministering as priestess in the ancient sanctuary which was the model by the way <laughs> which was a model show me that it's it's not there it's it's it is not there the only person, a woman, who tried to play the role of a priestess in the Bible was Jezebel. Mm -hmm. That was Jezebel. Mm -hmm. And you know how that ended up. Right. You know how that happened. Yeah. It was Jezebel. But yet, this man is allowed to indoctrinate young minds with sodomite. Now he's making the case again for what? For sodomy. Now let's go to Spectrum Magazine. February 5th, 2020. This is an article that he published. There is more to human sexuality than XX and XY. He's talking about the chromosomes, yeah. right? The chromosomes he's talking about. As children, we are all taught that humans come in two forms, male and female. What could be simpler? Notice, that's a question he asked. But notice what he says. As we become more educated, emphasis on the words more educated. So remember, he started by saying that 
we were taught as children that there are two forms, two kinds of human being, male and female. Isn't that what the Bible says? In the beginning, God created them, male and female. He created them, exactly. But then he asked the question, what could be simpler? Then he put this idea in your mind. As we become more educated. Okay, wow. that's what we were taught when we were kids. Male and female. But now we're becoming more educated, mm -hmm. right? As we're getting older, we're becoming more educated. Now we are discovering... Look, there are differences in the chromosomes or the X's, the XY's. That's where he's getting at. We learned that male and female are defined by possession of a specific combination of chromosomes. XX making a person female and XY making a person male. But notice carefully, he's questioning all of those things because now we, according to him, we're living in a different time. Notice, he says, recognizing that sexual and gender orientation is biologically based to a significant degree should prompt the church to do what? Mm -hmm. To revisit policies regarding the treatment of LGBTQ plus individuals as members of the church. If being gay or transgender simply represents part of normal, genetically based human variation, how can we consider these individuals any less value by God? Is it appropriate to hold them to a standard more rigid than expected of others in the church? Now, these are the men that they have allowed on Adventist pulpit, on Adventist universities to indoctrinate our young minds, even the older folks as well. These are the men's because he has what? He has a PhD, permanent head damage, next to his name. They have allowed these men, but person like myself, no. You can't come because why? You will agitate the people. The message that I will be bringing is unlike the new organization, the, the conference I'm referring to. Notice carefully what it goes on to, to say. Should such individuals continue to be admonished, to remain celibate, or face being disfellowship? He's making the case again for same-sex marriage within the Adventist church. Notice, goes on to say, the traditional basis for prohibiting same-sex marriage is the claim, notice, is the claim that the Bible prohibits it. It is true that some texts, notice, some texts, he says, in the Bible appear, keyword there, appear, some texts appear. In other words, what he's trying to say here is that we have taken those texts out of context. You understand? That's what he's saying. Notice, appear to prohibit certain kind of same-sex sexual behavior. But, do these prohibitions, notice, apply to all cases of same-sex sexual behavior? Can you hear the serpent speaking here? Yeah. Eve said, yeah. God told us, from the day we eat from that tree, we will surely die. We're not even supposed to touch it, she says. Yeah. And what did the devil say? Ye shall not surely die. Yeah. That was putting doubt in her mind. Did God really say that? You shall not surely die. That's what he just said. But do these prohibitions apply to all cases of same-sex sexual behavior? Now, question for you. What does the Bible say about leaven? A little leaven, leaven the whole, leaven lump. The whole lump. Yeah. But if you notice what he just said here, what does the Bible call homosexuality? A sin, right? What was one of the reasons why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? Because, because of the licentiousness, right? Yeah. Because of, you can go to Exodus chapter 19, right? Exodus chapter 19. As a matter of fact, let's read that quickly. Exodus chapter 19. Notice 
uh, not Exodus, I'm sorry, Genesis. I meant to say Genesis. You can read that in Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19, this is where we read about this account. Notice carefully. Bible says, As these men came to Lot, verse 4, But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, come past the house, round both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Notice, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out what? Unto us. For what reason? That we may know them. What does that mean? You can use your imagination. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door. That means he shut the house, the door of the house, the house that represents the church. And said, I pray you, brethren, do not so, what's the word? Wickedly. So, Lot said this was wickedness. And what is wickedness? It is a sin, yeah. right? It is a sin. Now let's go to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. The Bible tells us the same thing here in the book of Romans chapter 1. It is wickedness. What is it again? It is wickedness. And what is wickedness? It is a sin. Notice carefully in Romans chapter 1. The Bible tells us. This here, let's turn to verse 23. Romans chapter 1. Let's turn to verse 21. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be, what's the word? Wise. They became what? fools and change the what there's the word there glory the character the image of god the glory of the uncorruptible god into an image made like the uh, the what to corruptible men and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things wherefore god also gave them up to uncleanness through the loss of their own hearts to dishonor their what? Their own bodies. And what else? Between themselves. Who change the truth of God into a lie. And worship and serve the creature. More than the creator. Who is blessed forevermore. Amen. For this cause. God gave them up. Unto vile affections. For even their women. They change the natural use. Into that which is against nature. And likewise also the man, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn how? In their lusts, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Same thing that happened in Lot's days. And the Bible also tells us in the book of Leviticus, it is an abomination when they do that. Leviticus chapter 18, we go to Leviticus chapter 18. It is an abomination. Remember, God says that it is a sin. When you look at the commandment that deals with adultery, that commandment also covers this. So, like the Bible tells us that He is, God is the same yesterday today and forever. That means he does not change. And the commandments are what? A reflection of his law or his character. Notice, let's look at verse 22. Veticus chapter 18, verse 22. The Bible says, Thou shalt not do what? Lie with mankind as with womankind. It is what? Abomination. Abomination. It is an abomination. The same way he says, Neither shall thy lie with any beast to defy thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is what? Confusion. Defile not, it says, ye yourselves in any of these things. For in all these the nations are what? Defiled and 
which I cast out from what? Before you. So the nations have been defiled, just like we read of the Sodomites. And because of their defilement, what did God do? He cast them out. And he prepared the way. He removed them from the way of the children of Israel as they were about to come into the promised land. Same thing. And that's part of the loud cried message to expose Babylon. Amen? But notice carefully. Let's go back to the screen now. A careful review of all the relevant texts finds that none of them addresses same-sex sexual relations in the context of... Did you get that? So now the case that he's making is that those passages that I just looked at, he's saying that those passages do not address same-sex marriage. So therefore, it's okay to have same-sex marriage. What a deception, brothers and sisters. Notice, this is not surprising since same-sex marriage was not even considered, notice, was not even considered an option in ancient Hebrew culture. Thus, any treatment of the acceptability of same-sex sexual activity within a committed marriage relationship is also absent. You see the, you see the snake there? I, I wonder... How close are these men to Babylon? Well, they are very close to Babylon. They've been made drunk, as a matter of fact, by the wine of Babylon. Notice, it continues to say. Secondly, to consider same-sex marriage to be wrong, it needs to be shown to be morally wrong. Now, did we just show from the Bible here that it's morally wrong? Yes. It was very clear, very plain. Again, as we look at the commandment that says, Thou shalt not commit adultery, it covers bestiality, homosexuality as well. It covers all of that. Yeah. Notice, it goes on to say, Since there is no explicit prohibition of it in the Bible. Notice now. You know, this is why we need to do like a, not a surface reading of the scripture, not a surface study of the scripture, but a deep we need to dig deeper. When you go into the commandments that says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And when you look at what Paul has to say about adultery, do you know what it really means when, when he talks about adultery and all of these things? It means not only it covers bestiality, it covers uh, homosexuality, but it also covers pornographic, mm -hmm. pornea. That's one of the Greek words that Paul uses to describe this, pornea. That's what, that's what he uses. It covers when, for example, if a man or a woman expose their body to the opposite sex, to someone who is not their husband or their or, or, or their wife. You, you understand? It covers that as well. And, the, and what it does, it, case in point, David, Bathsheba, remember? Bathsheba, yeah. David and Bathsheba. Now, David was guilty, but Bathsheba was also guilty as well. Exactly. Because she openly exposed herself. She was also guilty. She openly exposed herself and that's what led to David's temptation. Yes, David is guilty mm -hmm. of what he, he did, but she was also guilty. Mm -hmm. Amen? She was also guilty. But notice, let's go back to the screen. Secondly, he said, to consider same-sex marriage to be wrong, it needs to be shown to be morally wrong. Since there is no explicit prohibition of it in the Bible. Even some explicit prohibitions in the Bible are considered to no longer be wrong because there is nothing morally wrong in doing them. A couple of examples, notice, of these kinds of prohibitions are found in Leviticus 19.19. Notice, of course, he's reading from this corrupt Babylonian Bible, NIV. Do not plant your field with two kinds of seed. Do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. 
Now he says, there's nothing morally wrong with either of these actions, so Christians do not consider them a sin. You see the argument he's making there? Because today we are accustomed to having uh, two kinds of materials in our clothing, and then it's common today where you have two kinds of seed planting in the field. So he said, it's the same thing today with homosexuality. There's nothing wrong with that. Let's go back to the screen. Conversely, something that is permitted in the Bible may be determined later to be morally wrong. A prime example of this is slavery. Notice, the Bible nowhere explicitly prohibits slavery and in most cases clearly tolerates or condones it, going so far as to outline laws that pertain to the owning and proper treatment of slaves. Nevertheless, no Christian today would consider slavery to be morally acceptable. That sounds so logical. That sounds so good, what he's saying here, but it has the venom of the serpent in it. That's right. right? Notice, it goes on to say, I am convinced that a large part of the reason the church persists in prohibiting same-sex marriage is what? is due to misguided purity wow. concerns yeah. driven by disgust of same-sex sexual behavior. Mm. Brothers and sisters, what this man is pushing for here is already inside of the church, but the church, the organization doesn't want you to know this. Yeah. So they have this infighting, so-called infighting, right? But what he's saying here, that's what we've been saying spreading throughout the organization. Recently, we read about how Advent Health under the General Conference has done what? Donated a million dollars to who? To a gay nightclub. Yeah. For what reason? To continue to promote sodomy. Mm -hmm. So, when the conference comes and, and give us their whatever they put out, publish on homosexuality, it's a smoke screen. Mm -hmm. Don't go by that. It's just a smoke screen they put out there. In the meanwhile, they have men like this guy within our churches, within our universities, promoting homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Is anything happening to them? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing is happening to those men. Mm -hmm. They are still prominent professors with their permanent head damage degree, teaching at our universities, and or pastors preaching behind Adventist pulpits. And what are they preaching? Babylonian doctrines. Notice carefully. He goes on to say, people often overcome these biases when a family member or close friend come out as gay or transgender, and it enables them to normalize their conception of what LGBTQ plus people are like. Once the church begins to see LGBTQ plus people as a normal part of the spectrum of human variation in sexuality and gender, it should enable us to see the moral rightness of same-sex marriage. So in other words, what this man is saying here, let just get rid of the Bible. That's basically what he's saying. Yeah. And let's just embrace the sodomite. What did Lot do when the sodomite wanted to come in? He shut the door. But this man is saying, let's open the doors wide. Notice, he goes on to say, a number of Christian denominations have been able to come to this conclusion. And it is my hope that what? The Seventh-day Adventist Church will reach this point soon as well. What point is that? The point where we open the door for the sodomites. Well, it's already here. Again, smoke screen. Notice what Spirit of Prophecy tells us here. Child Guidance, page 440. A terrible picture of the condition of the world has been presented before me. Immorality abounds everywhere. Licentiousness is the special sin of this age. Never did vice lift its deformed head with such boldness as now. The people seem to be what? Benumbed. And the lovers of virtue and true goodness 
are nearly discouraged by its boldness, strength, and prevalence. And you know what? The members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the majority of them have been benam. In some of our churches, this is being promoted, our universities. But do you hear a loud cry about it? No. Everybody is quiet. Notice. I was referred to which passage? Romans 1, 18, 32. Remember what we just read there? That is the passage that deals with men, with men. Yeah. And God says, i given them up to their own lusts, yeah. to this wickedness. Notice, as a true description of the world previous to when? To the second coming of Jesus Christ or the second appearing of Jesus Christ the condition of the world prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ as it was in the days of Lot so will it be in the last days they want to change the Bible notice again this tells us here from the Christian Institute new Archbishop of York says what Bible has to fit the what the current culture and what is the current culture he's referring to? Homosexuality. Mm -hmm. So we have to change the Bible to fit the current culture. And then it's the same thing, same thing that this pastor, John McLarty, is promoting as well at his church. Portions, he said, of the Bible should be rejected to accommodate who? LGBTQ. Which he says in his sermon, this was, again, at an Adventist church. He says that we must get rid of the ancient texts that Paul talked about that condemned homosexuality. Notice carefully with me. The incoming Archbishop of York believes biblical teaching on sexuality should come second to 21st century cultural beliefs. Stephen Cottrell will take over from Dr. John Sentimu in June, becoming the second most senior clergyman in the Church of England. In 2017, he said Christians need to reevaluate our understanding of human sexuality. Christians need to what? Reevaluate our understanding of homosexuality. Let's re that means let's rewrite the Bible. Notice. In 2017, he said Christians need to reevaluate our understanding of human sexuality and look again at Bible texts, Bible texts, to see what they are actually saying to our situation. To see what they are actually saying to our situation for what we know now is not what was known then. Wasn't that the same case that Adventist professor was making? What we know now, remember here when he was talking about the chromosomes? When we were a child, when you were a child, you learn that there are two forms yeah. of people, male and female. But as we're getting older, we are more, quote-unquote, educated, right? Now we have PhD, permanent head damage. Now, therefore, we have to reevaluate what the Bible says. Notice, let's continue. For what we know now is not what was known then. He also said there was no reason why thanksgiving prayers or a communion service could not be offered for civil partnerships. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, this is John Marklarty. Again, very similar movement. It's in the world, it's within the so-called Protestant churches, it's inside of Seventh-day Adventist church. Listen carefully. If we are going to be faithful to God, there are times when we must push back against the ancient words. Faithfulness to God does not always mean obedience to the ancient word. Faithfulness to God does not always mean obedience to the ancient word. Faithfulness to God does not always mean obedient to the, to the ancient word. What is the ancient word? The Bible. the Bible. So you don't have to always be obedient to what God says. That's what he's saying. Yeah. And what's the agenda he's pushing? Homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And who is he? A senior pastor of that church. And is he still a pastor there? Yes, he's still a pastor there. Sure. Notice. 
and hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5 tells us, If you say that you know him, and you keep not his commandment, you are what? You are a liar. You are a liar. Amen? Notice. I argue, I have done so in print, and now I will do it from the pulpit. So he has done this in printing, now he's going to do it from where? From the pulpit. What did Ellen White say when it comes to certain doctrines being presented to our people from the pulpit? She says, this kind of doctrine will come straight from the pit of hell. Notice. That it is time for us as a denomination, and it is time for us as a congregation to let go of the ancient texts that we have used to exclude people that God has clearly included. It doesn't work. What doesn't work? The Bible. The ancient text doesn't work. Let's stop driving and instead let's welcome. Let's not use the ancient text as a basis to exclude people that God has received and welcomed. Let's not use what? The ancient texts to cast out those God have welcomed. Which God is this? Two churches, remember? One church has made preparation to receive Jesus when he comes in his glory. The other church will not be able to stand that glory because they have been made drunk by the wine of Babylon. Notice, there's the statement there from Sister White. Testimony to minister 409. She says, many will do what? Will stand on our pulpits with the torch of false prophecy in their hands. Kindle where? From the hellish torch of Satan. And this is exactly what this man is doing. The doctrine that he's teaching there came straight from the pit of hell. While these things are happening in the world, we see the world embracing sodomy fully, openly, and the Seventh-day Adventist church as well. But again, as I cover these over and over and over again, you always find a faithful few here and there within the Roman Catholic Church and some other denomination that are standing up for truth. And as they hear the loud cried message, they will come out and be part of the remnant. Here is one example. Notice, this tells us here, Texas mega church votes to what? To leave UMC over what? Homosexuality debate. So that church choose to separate themselves from the Methodist church organization. They, because of the stand of the Methodist church to embrace homosexuality, so that church says, no, we are going to separate ourselves. We're going to stand on Bible truth. Notice, let's read. A United Methodist Church congregation in Texas with approximately 2,800 members has voted to leave the mainline denomination because of its debate over homosexuality. Grace Fellowship UMC of Katy voted December 15, 2019 to leave the UMC due to the, the what? Divisive debate on whether to amend the Book of Discipline to remove language calling hom homosexuality in compatible with Christian teaching. So they have in their teaching, in their belief, a book where it tells of their doctrines, which according to them came from the Bible. And one of the things that the book says is that homosexuality is a sin. But the organization, the Methodist organization, congregation, have been trying to remove that from their belief to embrace sodomy. So that church said, no, if you're going to do this, 
we are out. Notice. Why? So that we can fully devote our energies and what else? To fulfilling the mission and vision that God has given to us. That's the stand that we need to make in these last days because that's the spirit of Protestantism. Yet, we see all of these abominations taking place within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The majority sit back and stay quiet. But, but thank God, there are a faithful few that are standing up for truth, that realize, they realize that it is Jesus that we must follow. It is not an organization that we have been called to be holy as God himself is holy. We have been called to cleanse ourselves from all unrighteousness. Notice, it says here, if ye be willing and obedient, what else? Ye shall do what? Eat the good of the land. What are the conditions? Willing and what else? And, and be obedient. Obedient to what? To the law of God. Notice. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Notice. How is the faithful city become and what? Harlot. Harlot. How have those who have had, notice who this is referring to here. How have those who have had every opportunity to know the truth become what? Defiled with the corruptions of the ungodly. It was full of judgment, righteousness, large in it, but now murderers. What else? Thy silver has become dross, thy wine mixed with water. Now, this she also applied to the organization. How is the faithful city becomes a what? A harlot. That's the organization. That's the general conference of Seventh-day Adventists that has become a harlot. And like those faithful few within the Methodist church who do not have the amount of light that we have as a people, but yet they are standing up for the little bit of light that we have. They are allowing their lamp to be burned, to have the light of Jesus Christ. That little bit of oil that they have, they are using it. And you know what? The Bible says that God will bless them with more light. But those who have had great light, God will and not do anything with it, and have gone after Babylon, mm -hmm. God will take that away from them. Because God is coming for what kind of church? For a pure and holy church. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1 with me. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, Beginning in, well, let's back up to verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be what? Sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you when? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is what? The second coming of Jesus Christ. As obedient, there's the word obedient there. As obedient children, not do what? Fashioning. What does the word fashioning means? To conform, right? To yield. To what? Not fashioning yourselves according to the former loss in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is what? Holy. So how should we be? Be ye holy how? In all manner of what? Conversation. Of conversation. In all manner of conversation. You know what the word conversation means? Conduct. Yeah. In our conduct, in our character. Because God calls us and He is holy and He's calling us to holiness. As He says, as He called you to be holy, so be ye holy, holy in all manner of what? Conversation. Of conversation because it is written, be ye holy for I am what? For I am holy. God is not calling us 
to just give us our sins, to confess our sins, and then we can go back and do whatever we want to do. He's calling us to pure holiness, as we read before. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. So as we see these things happening in our world, we need to cry aloud to call a people out of Babylon. As we see them happening within the organization, within our church, we need to also cry aloud because we are seeing the wine of Babylon being embraced and preached and teach within our church. Hence, Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1. Cry aloud, spare now. And what must you do? Lift up your voice. There it is. Like a trumpet. And do what with it? Show my people their sins and the house of Israel their transgressions. Let's pray. Our Father God in heaven, again, you have given us much. Your word says, to whom much is given, much is required. Help us, Father, to use the light that you have given us so that you can impart unto us greater light. And help us, Father, as the Apostle Paul says, to allow you to transform us from glory to glory, from character to character, until that perfect day when you shall appear in the cloud of glory to deliver your people from this sinful world. I pray for your people wherever they are at this time, that they would surrender their lives to you. I pray for those, Lord, who have been leading your people astray, that they would repent and see their errors and come and ask for forgiveness. We pray for forgiveness for all of us here because we all have sinned and come short of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.